Welcome back to the podcast for Dr. David Markles, who last time we discussed the rise of early modern Russia from the fall of the Soviet Union until 2022. But this week we're going to then go to different topics, that is the infamous Euromaidan revolution. And we I read some did some research about this for this episode, of course. Um there's some it seems to be a little bit debate, was it a revolution or what let's most people call it a revolution, revolution, but was it really, do you agree that it was, in a sense, a revolution that what took place in 2014 that you were by now? I think it was a change of government, which is usually the basis for a revolution. Mm. Um, and it was a mass protest that resulted in the end of the Yanukovych presidency. And, you know, Russia claims that this was a coup d'etat, that it was an illegal takeover of government by nationalist forces. And Ukraine claims that it was all a democratic process, that uh, Yanukovych wasn't overthrown, he ran away, and he was preparing to leave for some time before he finally departed, and that therefore it was necessary to hold new elections, both for parliament and for president, which they subsequently did. Um, I guess the other point to it, though, is that the ruling party was the Regions Party, and Yanukovych came from the Regions Party. He was their leader, and the Regions Party completely dissolved um, as a result of Euromaidan. So you get the elimination not only of, of the president, but also of the political party that he led. So it's a, like a removal of all the leading groups in Ukrainian politics. And most of these people were based in Donbass region. So you've got a region that becomes quite alienated as a result of these, these changes. So I don't know what to call it. I don't know whether I'd call it a revolution, but I would certainly you know, call it a fundamental change of power. So let's, let's begin with... Well, before we you know, go briefly into from the Orange Revolution until the Euromaidan Revolution, but this, this wasn't the first revolution that took place on the Euromaidan, because of course you had, the, as I mentioned, the Orange Revolution in 2004. But what would be the difference this time from the Orange Revolution and the 2014 Euromaidan Revolution? I'm going to have to forgive me the revolution, but for the lack of better words, the Euromaidan, what would be the difference? Well, the Euro, uh, sorry, the Orange Revolution took place during a election for president, a presidential campaign, in which there were two main candidates that came forward. They were very familiar to each other. They they'd been uh, at the forefront of Ukrainian politics for a few years before that. Yanukovych for much longer, but Yushchenko at least from the late nineteen nineties, and. It was quite clear, I think, that Yanukovych was the chosen candidate, not only of uh, President Kuchma, who had been there for two terms, but also of President Putin in Moscow. Uh, there were campaigns in Moscow in support of Yanukovych, um, and probably some funding as well came from Russia. So he did appear to be... Uh, Russia's candidate and also Kuchma's candidate. And Kuchma was regarded by 2004 as a corrupt president, someone who had removed some political opponents, particularly in the media, by devious means. And I think many Ukrainians were hoping for some kind of change. And Yushchenko came forward as a former National Bank chairman, head of the Our Ukraine or Nasha Ukraina party, and with a clear pro-European direction. And it was a, it was a, the first real contest, I think, where you had two completely different goals of the, of the presidential candidates. And they also divided the country in terms of areas of support. It's clear that Yushchenko had the support of Western Ukraine and probably further to the east of that, all the way to Kiev, Whereas Yanukovych's base was in was in eastern Ukraine, particularly Donetsk, but not only Donetsk, and Crimea. And that divided the country more or less into, into two equal parts. And when the 
votes came in, um, well, they, they came in for the first round and, and Yushchenko and Yanukovych were ahead. They went into a second round. And in that second round, um, again, they were fairly even, but Yushchenko was quite clearly ahead until a mass bunch of votes came in from the Donbass region, which put Yanukovych in the lead. And many people felt that these votes coming in from the east were delayed, but also they were much inflated. In fact, there were more votes than there were voters coming in from the Donbass, which was, I mean, you don't get, you don't even get 90% of people in an election normally voting. That's quite unusual in Europe. And in this case, you were getting like 120% in the Donbass. And as a result of that, there were protests uh, in which the sides divided and the Ukrainian side wore orange. Uh, so the, the Yushchenko side wore orange scarves and orange ribbons. And the Yanukovych supporters wore uh, blue and yellow, uh, the Ukrainian state flag colors. And it created a, a period of mass protest, particularly in Maidan, that went on for a couple of weeks. And you had a tent city, you had a concerts taking place. It was all fairly benign, um, other than the politics themselves. But at some point, uh, Yushchenko had a meeting with security officials and his face began to come out in terrible swellings, almost uh, changing his appearance completely. And he had to go to Vienna uh, for hospital treatment in the middle of this and probably almost killed him. So there was this kind of devious under uh, undercurrent to that period of the election. But ultimately, the second round of the election was rerun. And this time, Yushchenko had a clear majority and defeated Yanukovych. And so then you've got a kind of orange government coming into power. So you could say that there was no real um, change of government in that period. Kuchma was not arrested. He was treated quite well. Even Yanukovych ultimately came back as prime minister uh, as the forces began to change between president and parliament. And the original prime minister, Yulia Tymoshenko, who was a close ally of Yushchenko in the Orange Revolution, uh, was became his enemy. They were bickering all the time and never really got along. So ultimately, Yanukovych came back as prime minister not long into the Yushchenko president. So you could say not that much change. Whereas I think Euromaidan was, was a different reason. It was because uh, Yanukovych um, decided not to sign an association agreement with the European Union which he promised to do. And it was due to be signed in Vilnius in November 2013. And he decided instead to accept a large loan from Vladimir Putin. And it issued the prospect of Ukraine joining the Russian-led Eurasian Economic Union. And that initiated a protest in Maidan in November 2013. And it was specifically over this one issue of Ukraine refusing to sign the Union Agreement. But that uh, Euromaidan went through several different phases. The first phase, I would say, was mainly student-led, peaceful, and for one specific purpose. But on the night of November 30th, um, as the demonstrators gradually began to clear the square, um, the government, Yanukovych presumably, sent in riot police to disperse the protesters in a very violent manner. And that inspired uh, protesters to actually go back to the square on December the 1st with a much larger protest, which clearly was intended to um, end the corruption in Ukraine and end this kind of brutality that was taking place and bring in a, a much more democratic society. There were many groups involved at different points. And I think on December the 1st, it still remained peaceful. But ultimately, you would get barricades put up. 
um, political groups began to join in, and the the people who were demonstrating uh, became a different sort of sector of society. They became sort of not people, not students, but people in the thirties and forties people who actually took place in the Orange Revolution and, let's say, more politically committed people. There were no obvious leaders, but you did start to get political elements coming into the square. And Yanukovych's tactics became much harsher, uh, using the police for fairly violent tactics against the demonstrators, who ultimately began to respond in the same kind of manner, throwing Molotov cocktails and I would say by February, more politicized, some right-wing groups like Pravi Sector joining in, um, much more international interest, you would say, many from European countries and even from the United States uh, offered support to the demonstrators by early uh, 2014. So you've got this you know, kind of mix of people, but ultimately, you were not getting any more about 50,000 people in the square. You were getting 10 times that many at peak periods. And this was something the government had no control over. It was There's no way to disperse it. it. just simply didn't have the forces to do that. So I think that's the difference between the two. Uh, basically, the Orange Revolution, you could say, was much smaller by comparison. Um, and the Orange Revolution, incidentally, was the second major protest in, in Maidan, because in 1990, there'd been a massive student protest um, that ultimately got rid, rid of the prime minister of Ukraine, uh, Vitaly Masol. And that was called the Granite Revolution because it took place on the on the granite, on the concrete. So the three of them uh, lined up so that Euromaidan is actually known as the third Maidan, and the Orange Revolution as the second Maidan. But they're getting bigger in size. So, so let's begin with what's really started the Euromaidan revolution, because as far as I understand, it began with a Facebook post that said, come to Euromaidan to protest the government. I'm just pushing a like button on this post. It doesn't help. It does, doesn't count. You have to be there. And it kind of went viral in U in Kiev and in Ukraine, and just in, at least in Kiev, as far as I understand. Yeah, I think you could call it the first real social media protest or large social media protest in Ukraine because it did begin by Facebook, a Facebook post. And this would not been the case with the Orange Revolution, which which was really pre-social media, right? 2004 was pre-Facebook. Yeah, it just it started pre by then. So it was or really... maybe just started. Yeah. yeah. So it offered a different dimension. And it offered a dimension as well because of the cameras that were placed around the square, which meant that people could actually watch what was happening. So people in North America and Europe could actually see the violence that took place on November the 30th. And this created a new dimension to protest where you could get people together, if you like a flash mob, where people suddenly gather and it's unpredictable. The authorities can't uh, prepare for it in any meaningful way. They suddenly have to face the situation where there's 50, 75,000 people out that you hadn't anticipated. And I think that's that's why it, it, it's, uh, it's taking on a new dimension. And you have a very corrupt government uh, in power that is, you might even call it a gangster regime. And although you this the, around the time when the supposed journalists disappeared as well, that in front of later that it kind of was... I don't believe it. I don't remember if it was Yanushenko who ordered the murder on him, but that there was some tapes surrounding the report. Oh no, that that was actually back in two thousand. That was the um, yeah the murder of Gongadze in two thousand, um, presumably on some kind of orders from the the president. I mean, tapes were found that that inculpate the president, or at least him saying. Can someone, you know, sort of get rid of this person is really annoying me. And then it, not exactly telling people to kill him, but saying it would be better if he was if he was removed. But this came to light during the Euromaidan revolution, right? This the whole scandal. Yeah, well, it, it came to light before then. Um, because but the fact was it had never really been resolved. No one had been uh, brought to justice for that. I mean, a factor I would say in um, 
in in the Euromaidan was the arrest of Yulia Tymoshenko by um, by the Yanukovych regime, and she was blamed for negotiating an energy deal with Moscow, which made many Ukrainians pay higher prices for oil and gas, and Yanukovych put her in jail. And she that was the obvious problem as far as the Europeans were concerned in Ukraine. This was an illegal, politically motivated arrest of a very prominent opposition politician. Um, the fact is that Yulia Tymoshenko was not, I think, the main reason why Euromaidan took place for most of the protesters. They had bigger motives. Their motives were the corruption of, of the regime and its, its proximity to Russia, the fact that it was really close to Putin and moving in the direction of the Eurasian economic community, which appeared to take Ukraine away from Europe and towards Russia. And this was the direction that Ukraine had voted against in 2004, and now it seemed to have come back again. So I think that they were probably the major factors. And in 2008, and onward, I would say relations between Ukraine and Russia had begun to deteriorate when um, Yushchenko was president, but also in Russia, Dmitry Medvedev was the president. And they broke off personal relations. And Ukraine was very concerned about the war that broke out in Georgia uh, shortly after Georgia declared its wish to join NATO in a membership action plan, of which Ukraine was also uh, an invitee. Ukraine was invited to join the same plan. And ultimately, that ended in a, a short war between Georgia and Russia and the occupation of major cities of Georgia. So already you could see a, an, a, a rise in tension. And then in 2012, mass protests in Russia against Putin coming back once again for a third term in office um, that were suppressed. And this occurred, you know, right before the the protests in, in the Maidan. So Russia was clearly going more, a more, more hardline direction um, and Yanukovych seemed to be moving closer to Russia. So I think these are all factors in why the Euromaidan developed. So let's begin with the first people arriving on, on, the, on the street. And what was, but I, want, but I also want to know what's the kind of like what you see in Russia where people are discouraged from protesting and was that kind of the case as well in in the ukraine at the time that people were discouraged from protests and it could ruin your career etc etc that it would be bad for you on your resume what that kind of what do you see in russia it's especially today but was that kind of the case in U ukraine as well i think the societies were developing in different directions even though you can see elements of both between 2010 and 2014, where uh, Yanukovych is trying to install something similar to the Russian system. But nevertheless, uh, he never had the mass support that Putin had in Russia. And the mass protests in Russia were, let's say, less likely to succeed because they didn't have... A democratic system in place. But keep in mind that Ukraine continues to have regular presidential and parliamentary elections. And in nearly every case, these elections replace the ruling group with another ruling group. Uh, Kuchma was, in fact, the only president of Ukraine who served for two terms. Um, otherwise, they're all served one term and then they're thrown out. And Putin essentially is it is never removed from power. He comes in in 2000, serves his two terms, but even when he steps down, uh, because the constitution doesn't allow for a third successive term, he becomes prime minister. So he's really sort of giving orders in the background to Medvedev. It is just much the last episode, I remember. Yeah, he's a much younger colleague. And then in 2012, after some violence, brutally suppressed, he comes back again. And this time he begin, he changes the constitution to six year term as president, renewable, which effectively means he's going to rule unopposed Definitely. for the next 12 years, right? And now we've got a situation coming up next year where there's another Russian election. Putin, providing he stays healthy, will likely run and win again. You don't have that in Ukraine, you don't have that kind of stability, but you have much more democracy. And 
even though there is corruption in Ukraine, and this is really was supposed to be the first target of the Zelensky presidency, um, it's not on the same kind of scale. And it wasn't the real goal, ultimately, of of the Euromaidan by February. It had started, it was an initial goal, but by February, I think there's clear evidence that they wanted a complete change of government. They wanted something different. They wanted a more democratic regime in place. And they're prepared to protest for their rights. Um, there was also a strong element against the Euromaidan, particularly from the Donbass and the South, um, initially not violent, but quite clearly some people were disturbed at the way things were developing. And they felt and it was... It is in the 2014 that the troubles in Donbass start, right? That, that, that This is where it really begin to kind of take off a little bit where the troubles in that, that yeah. region begin. Yeah. And I think the what you could say about the Donbass is not that it's it's so much pro-Russian, but that they're, they're pro-Donbass. They've almost got their own little society there. And they were in power. You know, they basically had power for four years under Yanukovych, that whole group of people in the cabinet that came from, from the Donetsk region. And suddenly they're removed from power. The region's party is gone. They've got no representation in Kiev. And there's a mass... Re revolt, which some people think is sort of sponsored by, by the West, by the Western powers, by the United States. And they feel alienated from what's happening in Kiev. And they want to retain the Russian language. They want, not because they're Russian, but most of them are still Ukrainian uh, in, in terms of population. But there is a large element of ethnic Russians, but also a majority of Russian speakers who are afraid that they may lose the rights to speak their own language and that their own language may be an impediment to their careers. And it's an area of deep corruption where you've got coal mines and steelworks and other industries that have begun a steep decline and really need a lot of attention. And you don't see that coming from Kiev. And I, I see that as more of a Donbass problem that Russia exploited ultimately but initially, you know, the invasion of Crimea was the starting point, a Russian invasion of Crimea in March of 2014 that followed the end of Euromaidan, which ended with a massacre of protesters in the square from snipers on rooftops um, and a lot of violence. And over 100 people killed in the square. But Yanukovych leaving Kiev and the whole region's party collapsing. So it's quite clear that there's going to be a change of government in Kiev. And so, at that point, I think Putin decides to intervene. So do forgive me for derailing a little bit, but to me, I feel like I also have to understand the situation in Ukraine as a whole as well in order to understand what's going on in you on the Euromaidan. So let's talk mm -hmm. about what how this there, because there is a society as well that develops in the Euromaidan when the people begin to protest at first. So let's talk about the first few weeks of protests and how, because I was mentioning it, begin rather peacefully, but more and more mm -hmm. people, not just from in the Kiev, but people from outside of Kiev, Kiev as well, begin to join in on the protests. Yeah, and, and also at the same time, you see changes of government in Western Ukraine, where these, these fairly corrupt regimes installed by Yanukovych uh, are removed by the by pop by the population in places like Lviv and Ternopil and others in western Ukraine. They began to change the local governments so that they're much uh, pro more pro Western, pro European, and many of the Western Ukrainians come to Kiev to take part in in Euromaidan. At the same time, Yanukovych is bringing in um, I don't know describe these people, but sort of hooligan types, uh, soccer supporters, people like that, coming in, giving some funds to break up the demonstrations, to help break up the demonstrations, attack people in the streets, intimidate people generally, along with these riot police or Berkut, most of whom also come from the eastern part of Ukraine. So it's like uh, 
two different sectors of society with diametrically opposed goals. And Euromaidan on a mass basis, reflecting perhaps, you know, the more pro-Western segments of Ukrainian society, and Yanukovych reluctant to resort to, let's say, the sort of violence you see in Moscow. But nevertheless, more and more, the riot police start to use violent methods and the demonstrators begin to respond. So by February 2014, you've got a lot of guns, um, other weapons in that square. So it becomes quite confused, I think. And these groups like Right Sector, um, Svoboda Political Party initially, although we didn't see it so much in February, and some kind of violent elements that are taking place. So it becomes much more intense. And the exchanges between the demonstrators and the police are increasingly violent as well. So you begin to see losses of lives, people dying as a result of this. And it doesn't really reach a peak until about February 14, 15, I think, and ultimately in February 2021, when you get the massacre in the square. And, you know, the people who carried out this massacre never were fully revealed. I mean, one one assumes that it was riot police, and this seems to me the most likely who carried it out. But there are sort of uh, speculators who maintain that, in fact, it may have been people on the Maidan who did some of the shooting that killed the riot police. Uh, It's unverified, and I've never really seen any kind of convincing explanation, but you know, it is there. There are different interpretations of what happened. But clearly it got very violent. And Russia was able to maintain afterwards that this was a kind of neo-Nazi takeover of Ukraine. Um, but in fact, when the elections took place afterwards, none of these extreme groups received much vote, much of a vote. You know, they were not represented in the governments that succeeded the Euromaidan. So if they were there, it was a temporary phenomenon um, that was part of the violence that took place. And then the government obviously took over. And Ukraine, I wouldn't say became peaceful, but you did have a more stable situation after the removal of Yanukovych than you had before. So let's talk about, uh, because it, we have to remember this is in winter, early winter, that, and, and during winter time, this will take place from November mm. to February. It's especially in Ukraine at that time, it's not a warm, it's not Florida, it's not 30 or yeah. 40 degrees, it's freezing. So imagine the cold that must have gone through the students and also also parents that would later join in that in in during the protest that stayed in day after day and protesting to throw, try to throw, throw the government. It's kind of been easy. That's true. And this is why you see so many fires, I think, in the square, you know, construction of, um, I don't know how you describe it now, but almost like little pyramids that, you know, you had fires taking place, that things, tires were burning. Um, you had tents there that had been there for some time. There were people cooking facilities. People were uh, treating people who were injured. Um, it was almost like a, a mini city that you had on the square. Um, but also, I think, you know, the, the violence that was taking place did discourage some people from staying there at the same time. Uh, some people may have gone home at night and come back the next the next day, um, but not enough that the government forces, the Burkut, could ever take over the square. You know, it was always guarded and it was always kind of protective barriers that were there. So clearly, the, you know, the government was not able to remove them. And I think um, overall, you know, it's a big factor, the fact that it was winter. If it had been a summer, the numbers probably would have been even larger. And maybe the violence would have been less. But the situation was very extreme on both sides. And the local hotel, the Dnipro Hotel right on the corner, had uh, elements of both, you know, taking shelter there on different floors. And many of the people in that hotel had weapons as well. And I think the the whole structure of the square... The kind of hold over 
from Soviet times when it used to be held for mass parades and mass meetings and things like that. So it was a traditional spot for gathering. And it's a huge square. Um, but there are many aspects to that square. And the the two hotels, the, the Hotel Ukraine and the Donetsk as well, um, were used, obviously, by people for to get warm. Um, so I think um, the winter was a factor for sure. So let's talk about, you mentioned the society that came to place, and I mentioned the parents coming in, what? but the, the, of course they were worried, so about when they came in, and how did the society kind of function, because where the students, where the, where the professors of the students kind of supporting the supporting them and coming in and doing the lectures, that kind of society, what, what kind of society was it that took place? Because we mentioned that they, uh, they were legal help, not, not legal help, but you know, they were or that would come later, I believe. But you know, there were soup kitchens there. There were medical care. Mm. Let's talk. So let's talk a little bit about society and how it developed under your mind, um, Barry. Well, you've seen the complete breakdown of of the government. But the government is no longer functioning effectively. Its orders are ignored. Um, its president is living in a in a palatial mansion about. 20 kilometers away, not part of the scene, there's a great fear of, of Russian intervention. Um, I think a fear of Russian intervention in Kiev in particular, which, which didn't materialize, uh, Russia took a different direction. Um, and so I would say it's, it's an unstable process, and it's unstable because there's no clear there was no clear leadership of Euromaidan. You can't. You cannot say there was a particular leader in place who was leading this rebellion. There wasn't. Um, whereas in the Orange Revolution, you have Yushchenko and, and, and Timoshenko as a defined leaders, if you like, of, of that uprising. This time you don't. You have different groups coming in representing more and more extreme factions, I would say. And this is why you were able ultimately to achieve a result that you couldn't go back, something that didn't happen in 2004. This time they went the whole way and ultimately the government was removed. You've also got the European Union uh, governments very worried and, and the French and German foreign ministers coming into Ukraine uh, and trying to reach an agreement between the cabinet and the protesters and, and Yanukovych, and that a provisional agreement was reached with the help of Germany and France that you would have uh, a cessation of hostilities between the two sides. You would have new elections, which were scheduled for December 2014, and Yanukovych would be allowed to stay in power between February and December, but then there would be elections, and that these would be monitored by European observers. But the protesters refused to agree to this. They didn't want Yanukovych to stay until December. They wanted the change immediately. And so the European intercession, if you like, uh, failed because by that time the two sides were so polarized. And I think there's logic in why the protesters didn't agree with that. I mean, in that inter intercession period, if you, Yanukovych had been allowed to remain, with the support of Russia, let's say, he could have called in Russian troops. He could have taken any kind of measure to install a, a military regime, um, some kind of uh, pro-Russian government, um, in the way that, say, Lukashenko did in Belarus in 2023. You know, the threat was always there that Russia would, would come in and would be behind him. And that's how he was able to stay in power. In Ukraine, that didn't happen. And, and that's because the protesters didn't agree uh, with, with this European idea. So I think that, that was really the main attempt to reach an agreement. And Yanukovych possibly realized at some point that he, he could not have any kind of impact on the situation and therefore the best option was for him to leave, leave office. Um, and he flew, you know, he moved to Donbass and then he was in Crimea for a while, ultimately ended up in Russia. Um, but interestingly, even though Russia 
invaded Crimea after that, they never attempted to reinstall Yanukovych. You know, ne that never came up on the agenda that he would come back as a president. It was extremely uh, unpopular with, with much of the crowd. And even, even I think, the supporters of Yanukovych were horrified by the kind of regime he'd put in place. So, so let's talk about, you mentioned some of your aid that the European Union or France tried to help out in the year of Maidan. But let's talk about the international press and how the, the, the international press came of media came to cover the situation. And but, but I imagine they were pro, the pro, pro protesters, but how did international media handle the situation that took place in the year of Maidan? Well, the international media, I think, was uh, Western media in particular was supportive and regarded these protests as legitimate and saw Ukraine's aspirations as moving towards Europe and, and more democratic society. But Ukraine wanted something different from this kind of post-Soviet era that, that had been in place since 1991. Uh, where you had leaderships that were essentially the same or descended from what you had in the Soviet period. That is, the first two Ukrainian presidents were very much tied to the Soviet regime. Um, the third president, Yushchenko, wasn't, but he was a great disappointment. Um, it's another question, of course. And then you had Yanukovych. Once again, you're going back to this pro-Moscow pro basis. And I think... Western Europe was sympathetic, but at the same time, it was nervous about the violence and how far it would go, uh, and that Ukraine wouldn't descend into some kind of civil war situation, which would cause chaos. I think the the view was that Ukraine um, was part of the Eurasian, uh, so the European Partnership Project, and that had aspirations to become associate member and ultimately full member of the European Union, and that was that should be supported, that most people in Ukraine would support that. NATO was another issue in 2014. That was far from clear that Ukraine ever would have aspirations to join NATO and that most people would be in favor of that. Uh, that wasn't the case in 2014. And I think at that time, if you look at opinion polls in Ukraine, which I did at the time, they're not particularly anti-Russian either. I mean, in terms of Russian population, there's not a great anti-Russian uh, sentiment and vice versa. But they do not want to be controlled by Russia. They don't want Putin making decisions that affect Ukraine's society. And I think that is the that is where things began to, to peak in terms of violence that was taking place and how far people were prepared to go to secure this. And the United States, Europeans, um, very much in favor, I think, in their media of what was happening Russia obviously very much opposed and very very supportive of what Putin wanted to do, and that is basically intervene, take back Crimea, and on the grounds that the Russian population there was in some danger from this group of fanatics in Kiev. Now, so let's talk a little bit about you mentioned Russia or the Russian side. Let's talk about the Russian side as well. Sorry for interrupting you, but let's talk about how Russian media and you know, the Kremlin reacted to the Euromont and of course in from from the start of the revolution until it developed and escalated further. Well it, it regarded the Euromaidan as entirely um Western Western in origin. The, the West Westerners had encouraged Ukrainians to protest. They were fun providing funding for the for the protests and supported the change of government. And they use this evidence the fact that some leading U.S. politicians had actually come to the to the Maidan, supported the process. Uh, John McCain was there. Um, several others um, had appeared with Ukrainian politicians in the square, and, and and therefore they were trying to take Ukraine away from its natural partner, mother, mother Russia. And this, I think, aroused a lot of sympathy in Russia and the fact that there were certain parts of Ukraine that felt intimidated, like the Donbass, like Crimea, like Odessa region, things like that. 
where they were not, they very much opposed what was happening in the Maidan. But remember in February of 2014, um, the Sochi Winter Olympics were taking place. This was a, a huge, prestigious event for Russia. And Putin in particular and several of his cabinet were at these games all the time. I mean, they were simply watching the athletes. They were praising them. They appeared on the stage in the crowd. And this was a big diversion. So for some time, I think, um, Russia was preoccupied. But as the situation in Kiev escalated, Putin decided to act and went to the parliament and asked for military powers, special military powers to intervene in Crimea. And the Crimean situation had, had never been very stable anyway in Ukraine. And you had um, this agreement from 1997 and later 2010, where you had two bases of the Russian Black Sea Fleet in Sevastopol, uh, the largest port there, and the traditional home of the Black Sea Fleet. 83% of that fleet was Russian fleet, and only a small part was the Ukrainian fleet. So they were already there at the bases. So the potential for an invasion was always in the background. And it was not the first case where you had a plan to invade Crimea. There's evidence that plans were um, elaborated back in 2008 when the war took place in Georgia. There was also a plan to invade Crimea that was never put into operation. So now it could be put into operation in 2014, and it just took place very quickly. Uh, the Ukrainians were in no way prepared for this. The population had a majority of ethnic Russians, and that wasn't the case for anywhere else in Ukraine. So, and also by taking Crimea, Putin gained a lot of popularity because the, the sentiment in Russia about Crimea was always that this, this belongs to us. It was taken away by some ridiculous means in 1954. And then in 1991, when the Soviet Union collapsed, it, it just became a part of Ukraine. But it was never intended to be that way. And the population had never wanted that. So this was a vulnerable area of Ukraine. And Russia decided that this would be the time to intervene. And having done that so, so successfully, then why not try the same thing in the eastern part of Ukraine and see if the population there will respond if Russia provokes changes of local governments, small uprisings, etc., in the major cities of eastern Ukraine, Kharkiv, um, Luhansk, Donetsk, Dnipropetrovsk, as it was called then, these major cities, um, and see what will happen. And it was only really, I think, in in Luhansk that you got a clear move in favor of a of a Russian pro Russian government. All the other cities rejected it, um, but in Donetsk, ultimately. Um, you got a group of hardliners that managed to take over and a, re a referendum then took place that declared them uh, independent. Independent uh, regimes called Donetsk People's Republic, Luhansk People's Republic, uh, that, were, that continued to be ruled by these local elements. But a war then breaking out as Ukraine tried to, to regain them. In, in 2014. No, I didn't think we were running out of time, unfortunately, but, but let's talk about the end. So let's talk about the end of the Euromaidan and how the violence escalated and Yanushenko running away from the parliament and how he's, he was caught at the airport as well when he was fleeing, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah, he was, he was, he was seen at the airport. Um, and You know, his running away was was his decision. You know, it was like, in many ways, although he was a gangster type who'd been arrested in his youth twice and in prison for some time, um, he was fairly cowardly when it came to the crunch and dealing with this uprising and did not did not want to use mass force. I mean, I think that's fairly obvious that he, although there were massacres of, of, of over 100 people and he'd ordered the violence, uh, he was not prepared to go into some kind of mass war. 
and he ran away ultimately. Whereas I think you could say that someone like Putin would have cleared the square, or Lukashenko, for example, would have tried to clear the square completely. He didn't go that far. And once he once he'd been removed from the scene, then it was fairly straightforward how Ukraine would proceed. They used methods that they used before. They had an interim president, Alexander Turchinov, and they organized new elections, at which the regions party would not be taking part, and ultimately a presidential election, which elected a traditional old-style businessman politician, Petro Poroshenko, who was, I would say, middle. You know, if you look at his political views, he's middle of the road. He's pro-European, but he's not a fanatic. And he was not someone who was likely to um, to upset Putin too much, since Putin had seen him around for a long time. And, he, and in fact, Poroshenko was one of the original founders of the Regents Party. So it wasn't as if he was something completely new. Um, ultimately, Poroshenko moved uh, strongly in a pro-European direction and became much more hostile toward Russia in his actions, uh, nationalizing the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, for example, imposing martial law at one stage as after an altercation in Crimea, uh, putting much emphasis on the Ukrainian language and things like that. But when he first came in in 2014, I don't think it was obvious which direction Ukraine would, would go in particular. Um, and the parliament was completely representative of Ukrainian society. I mean, apart from the loss of the regions, um, the opposition bloc was still very strong. Communists could still enter parliament at that time. It was only later that they began to be banned. And you had, I would say, a very middle-of-the-road kind of parliament that replaced the original one. So you could say that was ultimately quite peaceful, except for the fact that they'd lost Crimea and also increasingly savage war taking place in the Donbass, which Russia ultimately intervenes at least twice in major battles in the fall of 2014 and spring of 2015. And then ending, if you like, on a, an agreement signed in Minsk, um, mediated by Lukashenko, and called the Minsk Accords, uh, two Minsk Accords. Uh, basically, the idea was to remove all the major forces fighting in the Donbass, um, install a demilitarized zone, uh, Ukraine to give local power, if you like, to give more autonomy to the Donbass, and then ultimately to have control over its eastern border again, which it never, in fact, got. Uh, an unsatisfactory agreement in many ways, and one that could not be fulfilled by either side. Uh, but with the Germans and the French once more coming in and taking part, as well as Putin, Yanukovych, and even the two leaders of the breakaway governments in the Donbass signed the final document uh, of the Minsk Accords. But as we see today, it was only a temporary, temporary kind of truce. I want to ask if Yanukovych has not left Parliament would have ended up standing at trial for. After, I'm pretty sure he would have been. He the... would have been arrested. Yeah, he would have been arrested and put on trial, and almost certainly convicted, because I think you know majority of people, slight majority you could say supported Euromaidan, but there were members who were opposed to Maidan who felt Yanukovych was an extremely corrupt president. I think he was. It was evident to to almost everyone that this was a, a gangster regime, um, somewhat reminiscent to what we have in Russia today, but it would only, it would only have got worse if it had come back again. No, I, I also want to ask before we, we go, because, you know, the way things turned out, as you mentioned, it wasn't conceivable that Ukraine would join NATO in 2014, but the way things have been since until 2023 today, with the Ukrainian war and how the government changed things, the Euromaidan, you see that after the war is finished, it, it, do you see any possibility of Ukraine joining NATO? Yes, I do. But I think it would have, it would depend on the war going well henceforth, that you would get the complete removal of the Russian army from Ukrainian territory, and that is territory that it had in 1991. And that you would have some kind of agreement in place um, for a settlement, a more permanent settlement, because 
you know, Russia broke all the agreements it made prior to then, uh, particularly Budapest Memorandum, but also the Treaty of 1997 with Ukraine, completely violated. You would need some kind of agreement in place that would preclude this happening all over again. And I don't think you could just get that from, say, the Western powers, the, the Western powers dictating what Russia is going to do. It would take much more. It would take uh, other major powers, thinking perhaps of China, India, but also the intervention of some middle powers like Turkey, perhaps Israel, others around the Black Sea region, that would more or less oblige Russia to keep to its agreement. And it may require the removal of the complete group that's in power in Moscow now, this whole Security Council behind Putin, where I think if Putin himself died tomorrow, the situation wouldn't change because some of the others would, would have equally extreme views and want to propagate the war uh, in the future. But I don't think the Russian regime will last forever. You know, I think it's a short-term thing, as the Wagner uprising showed how weak it really is. And ultimately, a defeat of the Russian army in the field. If you don't have that, if you have the war dragging on and on and on and on, uh, then Ukraine can't possibly join NATO anytime in the near future because you've got to have a, a more stable situation with clear boundaries of where Ukraine begins and ends. So, do you think we'll see a turning point this year in the ongoing war? I wouldn't think so this year, but I think probably next year you could uh, if Ukraine continues to get the sort of weapons it needs, particularly in the air, because right now Ukraine is still very susceptible to Russian missiles. It doesn't have control of its own airspace. And in order to win a war, you really need that. Um, because otherwise the danger is always going to be there of further bombs and missiles attacking Ukrainian territory. I think we're going to round it up. Thank you so much for coming back on the podcast. It's been a pleasure to talk to you again. And before we go, do you have any social media and the links that you want to put in the description that you know, you want to share? Um, well, I think just overall that the commitment of the European Union to Ukraine's future and the commitment of the United States and Canada is absolutely crucial. And if there are any kind of impediments to that, which Putin is looking for, he's trying to sort of create some kind of rift with, within the European Union and uh, or between the European Union and the UK, because the UK is also very much on board. Um, and you get these oddities, you know, like Hungary and possibly Italy and even France sort of wavering at times. But I think on the whole, the unity has been quite remarkable. And the fact that Sweden and Finland have now joined NATO only strengthens this. And I think the Europeans have to encourage middle powers, powers who have not committed themselves to Ukraine's cause and to Ukraine's future, have to be brought on board as well. You need more. Um, so that's I, I would sort of end on that note, that the more powers that can be brought in to join the European Union, UK and North America, the stronger Ukraine's case will be, and the stronger Ukraine's future will be. Thank you so much again for coming on. It's been a pleasure to have you back. This has been one that age as well. We are available on Instagram, Twitter, wherever you can find us. Uh, sorry, on Instagram and the Red as well, on Twitter, Red that as well. My name is Alan. Please like, share, and subscribe. You can find us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you can find podcasts these days. If you are on Spotify, please consider leaving us five stars. If you are on Apple Podcasts or iTunes, please write a review of us. That would help us out a lot. Again, like, share, and subscribe. And I'll see you next time.